Okay. Such a needy. Uh, Welcome, everyone. Uh, so it's interesting we're uh, doing the learner framework, which is uh, the 16th section of the book. Um, and in some of the courses, okay, it's, it's been uh, in chapter 19, uh, chapter uh, 9. So it, it is basically taking on the basic concept of uh, learners and then actually developing a framework to make it more dynamic. And in the video that uh, he went through during the process, he showed in there how you start with a basic learner and kind of compare and contrast what made it inflexible and then started demonstrating what this looked like. I didn't come across that actual notebook anywhere, um, but I did pull um, this one from 19. Oh, actually, sorry, you can't see that one. So if either of you have the actual notebook that he went through, um, let me know. Otherwise, we can kind of walk through this one, but this one does talk through uh, pictures rather than um, actually looking at um, the isn't internet. Isn't this the actual one, 19 Learner? So this one goes through uh, different data set that, uh, as far as I could tell, was about uh, rec uh, from pictures of the Moving a little slow on me. And the reason why I, I, I questioned on that was because when I was going through the video, the, the sections were off slightly. But yeah, I mean, he did. He does change. I made a note of this myself. He does change. They went back and like changed the the notebooks a bit. So like like changed like they were. He was talking about using. Uh, 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 context managers and the actual notebook he uses it does that for a little bit then it switches over to using a decorator because that turns out to be actually better than that anyway so things like that change so and there's some other change i figured what it was but okay yeah so we'll go through that afterwards so the main takeaway yeah. on, on the code what we're looking at is the learner which is just the, the basic component of the training machine learning models which is typically a data pre uh, processing, training step, validation. Now we're starting to put it more into an actual framework um, to provide additional functionalities, which include hyperparameter tuning, advanced metrics, flexibility. And a lot of the papers go into uh, how the learning rate impacts the uh, overfitting, underfitting, and how these hyperparameter tunings are very important for uh, model accuracy moving forward. Uh, really, difference, complexity, extensibility. It's almost like a pipeline that you would see in Py uh, Python where it does most of the work to get you there. The other one that takes a bit further to actually get into the metrics and, the, and so on. But there are certain steps that you could put into this to run through the standard processes. And I'm not sure if you've gone through that in the Sky Kit Learn, uh, Sky Kit Learn library. But just wanted to show that this is actually a package called Pipeline, which I realize again I'm on a different browser on the side. And Your notebook is different. The one that he went through is in that course 22P2 GitHub repo I posted in chat. It's called 09learner.ipimd. Where'd you find that 19learner from? That one came from. Uh, the fast book. I think that's the repository. Oh, of yeah. So that would be different, right? The, yeah. The fast book version is, he doesn't refer to that one in this thing. He's talking about this new one he's made. Okay. So I'll make sure not to confuse anyone by using this one. Just thank you for sharing. Yeah. That. Yeah. So if you're looking at for something similar, um, pipeline is very similar on the Python side. Um, the sequence of data transformers, I mean, you can utilize that to help with. Um, you basically, instead of having to do all those steps manually, you can provide a <clears throat> a list of tuples. Basically, says um, I want to one hot encode, and then I want to do this, and then I want to do this. You pass it in, and then you can apply it as part of your process. Uh, it's very helpful for when you have to make multiple models and iterations. You're not having to manually overwrite each time. And the way that we can work with these learner 
frameworks is really taking advantage of these callbacks. Um, and that allow, it allows for customizable behavior during the training process and really breaking down into at the different points in the epoch, um, there could be different actions that occur, so at the beginning or at the end, or after a certain number of steps, you do something. And this enhances the training process because it does allow for um, adjustments, uh, early stopping, and we will see here shortly how to recognize those adjustments and learning rate, and of course, saving the models. Um, so training efficiency and adaptability are the two main takes on those. We'll go a little bit more detail on those, but does anyone want to add anything to the general takeaways on these three terms? No, I think that captures it. So the paper from Zach Mueller, I was not able to open, and I didn't spend any time really tracking it down elsewhere, but I was going to talk through the two um, papers on Leslie Smith because uh, she, I felt like she did a really great job of highlighting um, some key concepts behind how you would recognize um, the impact of the learning rate, should it be high or lower, overfitting, underfitting, um, and some other thoughts as you're building in behind here. So she introduced this concept of cyclical learning rate, which basically is a learning rate that oscillates between a maximum and minimum, uh, rather than uh, comparing that to, say, an adaptable learning rate. And it provides better generalization, uh, and there's less hyperparameter tuning required, so it makes it simple, but it also um, is compatible to a variety of optimizers. Uh, and the, the goal out of, out of this is really to be able to adjust that learning rate uh, for model performance within those boundaries. Um, so highlighting the steps uh, from her paper, really the contributions are um, methodology for setting global learning rates, and surprisingly, the rise and fall of learning rates is actually beneficial over the model process. Um, on the longer term, which temporarily, if you were only to do this for a little bit, it could harm the network. So we're looking at um, longer, longer exposure to it. And they were able to demonstrate these on a variety of uh, popular data sets. Has either of you worked on these outside of this notebook. No. I have not. <laughs> so on the, on the left side, really just looking at um, the different uh, learning rates at a given time step, and then you uh, take the min plus the max minus min or the in between, and then you multiply it by a scale. And that is what controls the um, periods of the cycle of the learning rate. And there was a recommendation that the scale could be triangular. Um, and the idea here is that step size uh, peaks, your maximum and base, and we'll talk a little bit about those. Um, and so that's kind of what it looks like behind the scenes if you were to see this, is that basically we're taking that learning rate from that minimum bound, which we set, to the maximum bound, which we set, and uh, over time, as that uh, continues additional uh, periods, it, it helps improve the performance. So two of the questions that really comes from that is, how do you estimate a good value for the cycle length, and how do you kind of figure out this minimum and maximum boundary, uh, since those are ones that you would control, and it seems relevant to make sure that Kind of have a general uh, framework for it. Obviously, there's room for additional ways to approach it. But when we look at the step size, um, it's really it's tied to um, the iterations in an ep uh, epoch. Epoch. Epoch, right? Is that, am I saying that right? I'm not saying like in weird. Uh, okay. Sometimes I get hung up on the pronunciation on some of these words. And uh, I go. Oh, I was going to say I think that's heard epoch and epoch yeah I, so i guess either one uh, tomato tomato uh, 
there was a famous quote somewhere, at least I pretend it's famous, it probably is, but I remember someone saying, never, never trust somebody who pronounces something wrong because it means they learn from learn, uh, learn from reading, and, you know, that's a powerful thing, but, um, but yeah, this is divided by uh, number of training images by the batch size, so we're starting to see the importance of a few different terms here, batch size, epic, um, and of the input parameters, which is what she focuses on in the second paper. Now comes the test for how do we get the minimum and the maximum. And the idea here is basically that you use this LR range test. And the LR range test is where the triangles come into to, um, play as being helpful because it makes it fairly simple to run this. The idea here is that basically you start off by setting the base to a minimum value and the max to a maximum value. And then the step size and max iteration is the same number. And as you go through it, the learning rate will increase linearly from the minimum to maximum over the short term. And then as you take that and uh, the results and plot the accuracy there, there should be two distinct points that um, you should be able to identify on that is when the accuracy starts to increase and when the accuracy finally starts to slow or become flat and jag, jag, uh, raggedy, raggedy, ragged or uh, starts to decline. And the, where it starts to improve, that would be your lower bound. That's what, what you ultimately set as your base LR. And then where that other point is where it starts to flatten or decline is what you would set as your maximum bound. I realize when people say things are very simple or easy, it, that's relative, but seem, seem right. Okay. So any questions on that first paper? Did you all have a chance to go through it or? Uh, good news is the paper itself, the actual content is fairly short. The rest of it is all about applying it to the different um, data sets. But the second paper, I, I would encourage uh, definitely a lot of great takeaways on it about kind of knowing what overfitting looks like, underfitting, and the relationship between them. Um, so this is the second paper, the part one, where um, kind of understanding how neural network hyperparameters work, and this one really touches upon the impacts and on learning rate, batch size, momentum, and weight decay on uh, accuracy, and uh, how you can start finding optimal learning rates by testing over a various range of these. So we're still doing that cyclical aspect of it from the minimum and maximum. But now we're looking at um, a few different uh, other um, systematic tuning options as well. The learning rate is the biggest, um, is the, matters the most, and too small of a learning rate tends to lead to overfitting, uh, and usually larger learning rates tend to improve that. But if you go too large with the learning rate, then you're going to go where the training data starts to diverge and you're not going to get very great accuracy at that point. Um, larger batch sizes, um, again, we're looking at that workflow or that framework to put all this together so that we don't have to do this one thing. When we go, we can start to now implement them in the code itself. And I realized my text got extremely small. I apologize on that. I don't know why that resized. I'm just going to delete this to make this bigger. Okay. Is that at least a little bit readable, or do I need to make it bigger for you all? It's okay. And also on Zoom now, you can zoom, you can uh, change it on your individual screen. Right. Like I can zoom in on your screen. Okay. Yeah, it looks like um, everything fit on here except for the last little bit. But um, yeah, so these are the um, six key remarks about um, you know kind of seeing how this goes, and we'll see this in the charts themselves. Um, we'll start on this side first. This is the general equation um, working through it. So it's a, a component of the learning rate at certain uh, and the gradient of the cost function. So as we start to see the model complexity increase. Um, we see that prediction error start to go up to a certain point. And that's 
optimally right at this um, trough here. You start to see over here, it's going to be overfitting, and here where they're still going down will be that underfitting. Um, and so that's generally what we're seeing. Uh, this is a very simple version of it, um, but there are some considerations that go into it, and that's what those different remarks are. Um, there is a maximum uh, learning rate speed that you can go, so you can't just do infinity all the time or you know, crazy. Uh, so that does impact um, your minimum maximum as well um, based on that maximum speed. So test validation loss is a great place to start to uh, look for uh, the performance between the training and the final test accuracy. Um, hyperparameter tuning is the achieving the horizontal part of the test loss, which we'll show on the other one. Uh, basically flattens it out when it's longer C um, and then improvement of negligible improvement at that point. Um, yeah, regularization should be balanced across the data set and architecture. Uh, and those different forms could, uh, and, and including those with very large learning rates, makes it a little bit, a lot more efficient. So it's a, it's a according to this, a very uh, important influence on that efficiency. Um, so we want the highest performance while minimizing the needed computational time. Uh, and each of these remarks are directly out of the paper, just letting you know it. Um, kind of just grabbed them because they were a great summary of each. Um, and then optimal momentum values will improve network training. So this is uh, where she starts to go into that aspect of it. And the value of the weight decay. So looking through these in her remarks, she introduces the importance and the impact of looking at these other uh, um, parts of that systematic hypertuning, which is the weight decay here in remark six um, and momentum. And the last one being <clears throat> Any questions on this concept here or okay. so looking across these just kind of looking at two sets of pictures here uh, charts here is we're looking at uh, characteristic plots for these training loss validation accuracy validation loss and generalization error um, and This is from one of the data sets they went through. We move into starting to recognize when there's underfitting and overfitting. And when we're seeing underfitting, we start to see that characterized by a continuously decreasing test loss uh, rather than a horizontal plateau. So test loss over there. So those are two different versions of it. Um, increasing the learning rate helps to a certain point, then it becomes too much. So if you have underfitting, increasing the learning rate will help improve that. And then comparing that to overfitting here, where we see all of a sudden the, um, the loss come up, and even this one looks less um, hard, harder to recognize this one as easily because it's not as drastic at that point. Um, and each one of these overall, these are all examples of incorrectly set hyperparameters. So it's really it just all boils down to. So recognize making sure you understand and recognize the components that go into how do you how can you visually tell there's underfitting going on and or overfitting. And or overfitting, and what you can possibly do to remedy that. So the outcome.
outcome of the overall paper is essentially to create a recipe for this process. By following this in four steps, first focusing on the learning rate and then working your way down, um, you can actually build this into a replicable framework um, to apply to your code moving forward. So starting with the um, learning rate, again, following from the LR test from prior, starting with a large learning rate, uh, you can tell that it does vary based off of the data set. But you might also want to try one maximum. The saddle points do um, kind of in, um, interfere with those learning rates. Uh, it's not, not as steep of a gradient during that time. And But you're going to use that LR range test that we spoke about earlier. And then there are other factors that influence on this. But again, you can start to piece together some of these key takeaways. And again, the rate of learning rate increase uh, could create those instabilities. Looking at the batch size, um, is a really how much GPU memory, memory you may have. Uh, and they recommend that the batch size of GPU multiplied by the number of GPUs um, is when you have multiple of them, that's how, what your batch size would look like. Um, so they recommend overall very large batch sizes if you can, or larger batch sizes, so that learning rate can be larger during those. Um, so whether you split it across GPUs or just have the one, what will allow you to have the larger learning rate is, is the large batch sizes. Looking at momentum, uh, looking across those short runs rather than looking at the entire process, um, and that cyclical momentum starts at the maximum and then until decreases to that bottom. And this will help stabilize some of that convergence when uh, looking at the larger rates and values. So if you're starting to see where you're diverging too large of one, you may be able to adjust this momentum to potentially go there. Again, it, it depends on how um, there. So you do have the option here of a constant momentum or um, a momentum that does fluctuate. And then finally, weight decay. Um, Cry is a grid search um, for a magnitude of this. And this does involve your own knowledge of the data set and which to test. Um, and I guess I cut off mid-sentence, hopefully. No one's like cliffhanger there for what the last uh, one is. But this is, um, this is as if you go into that second paper, part one, uh, she does highlight this um, as the recipe guide and recommends that this can be expanded on that. But um, so a shallow architecture requires more regularization. Uh, so test larger weight decay values. And in this case, what she was recommending was 10 to the negative. Two, negative three, and to the negative four um, in that process compared to less uh, smaller weight decays, which in this case were 10 to the negative four, negative five, and negative six. And then that's for hyperparameter optimization. Questions on any of that or? Going through the code, did you feel like you were seeing that happening? Could this kind of help explain a little bit better why that was going on? I don't think he really talked through these things at all in the in the lecture that I saw. Um, I'm not sure what, even why the papers are listed there, but um, they're relative. They're relevant because he was talking a little bit about um, you know doing the the learning rate callback. He was using that old that. The callback, the learning rate finder that he introduced before, where he just watches the learning rate or as go as he goes through the batches, and then when it starts going back up, um, he knows he has to come back up a little bit, and that's the learning learning rate he uses, <clears throat> rather than using the cycle uh, learning rate thing. But I think the cycle learning rate is what's used in fast AI, I believe, right? Yeah. Yeah, because he had listed three papers that were kind of the basis for this. Um, down here, and that's where that's just where I was reading through those. I, I was um, I lost, I didn't lose interest, but I paid more attention to those because um, I'm also taking a course where it's about the mathematics under the hood. 
go ah, gotcha. uh, versus the actual application. So I was kind of just uh, perusing it that way. But I thought it was kind of interesting because a lot of times when we go to like these trainings and everything, they show us how to use the package and sometimes we don't always know all the uh, details behind it or why we went with a certain one or the other. Um, but hopefully, uh, but both of those papers were interesting to see as you're working through network hyperparameters. There's uh, quite a bit of um, visuals in there that help you uh, identify when there's a um, we're under, overfitting, underfitting, and here are some potential ways that you can um, approach this. So that being said, do you want to walk through the one that he did on the video and talk through that? It one? looks like he actually gets around to talking about the cyclic learning rate uh, thing in lesson 18 for some reason. So I don't know why they have that paper here. but the... <laughs> Yeah, it was interesting because I mentioned like- He links the paper again then. One but... section, it's nine and another, which is where you found it here. And then it's- um, this, Yeah. So this was the original- yeah, the ones for the um, this this part of the course are linked only in the very first part of this, the number nine, where it says, "Hey, this is the course repo," and those notebooks in the course repo he uses every time. So that course repo, uh, which I guess I could make sure it gets linked again, but maybe we should make a bookmark for it too. In the, I'll put it in this like this is the. Yeah, and I mean, this one's creating a learner from scratch if there is an interest in looking at it from a different one. This was looking at images where I believe this one was the same uh, NS and T data set. Um, and he, he was kind of explaining the difference between, you know, what made this very um, rigid uh, process and that it didn't allow for a lot of the additional hyperparameter tuning in here. Um, and so start off with a basic callback learner and then started to look through the metrics within them um, to kind of see how they're, they're going. And then in the, in the video, he started talking a little bit more about adding a flexibility, which uh, is the, what I would call the framework. Um, and as you can tell, you start to have a little bit more um, cases or conditions throughout each of these that will allow the, um, the tuning to occur. And yeah, and I, I would point out that the version that's in the notebooks is an evolution beyond what he, when he was showing, whenever he was showing, it's the same notebook, but when he was showing it, it was an earlier version. And so this one that you're looking at right now is, is more complicated has more stuff in it than the one he actually talked about because they went back and added stuff to which, you know, is a little confusing. I can't remember exactly what he added, but I think, oh, for example, in the fit method for that flexible learner, he added like uh, the train equals true, validation equals true, co extra callbacks for the fit and more parameters to it that weren't in that video. Mm. This is an example, but anyway, I just point that out. No, that's good. Thank you. Because it makes me feel better that I was like, I didn't find the data, uh, the same notebook because I was looking and I was like, even this one is different too. So, um, yeah, I was completely lost on it. I'm just going to see here if there's anything worth pulling out of here. I did put a link to the repo on the bookmarks for, the, for our channel and link and in the chat too, but also in the channel. Thanks for doing that. Yeah, thank you. I know. I mean, so I keep having to hunt it down every time because it's only mentioned mm -hmm. on the I don't know why they don't mention it every time. They have all these links. Put a link to the notebook you're using. Why is that so hard? I recall from last time I was able to make it, like I said, this is a very, it's become like the prime spot in my schedule is the six or seven spot on Wednesday. So, um, yeah, okay. So, like, gotcha. really schedule off. But, um, was like that you guys kind of stopped looking at the fast book one and that's why I was like I'm probably not looking at the right one because there was a deviation I think where where I last spoke was like the chapter didn't start till like over halfway through the videos and it was kind of like split between the two um must have been two months ago I guess at this point yeah so he just he starts to go through these a little bit more this is about uh, towards images uh, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, 
Um, he did talk about, uh, for example, the use of the um, the get at uh, get attributes um, and how to utilize those in there. Um, and here's what a callback here, setting up a learner callback, um, and then. Are you all familiar with the inheritance with object-oriented programming with the self? Yeah. Well, oh, that's because I know this is a more based uh, group. But yeah. And then, yeah, so if you wanted to look at another example, this is a 19 learner ITYMB, and I got that from the FastBook itself um, repository. And one thing that's really uh, bringing out in here is the importance of being able to track and print progress, especially as you're developing these, so that you know like where you are in this process. And if it does break, it if you could really highlight where that occurred at would be very helpful. So being able to print um, the steps or the processes that after after a certain point are great ways to help you with the debugging process to. Um, reduce the amount of time you have to search for uh, getting the actual error location. And this is the learner. And you can see we have our. Um, yeah, I guess in the new version, he calls that the metrics callback now. Metrics. And, he, and he ends up using a, a, a built in one from PyTorch. Now to do it. But or here is it. where they're actually looking to create the learning rate. Um, I'm not going to pretend I know how to pronounce that, uh, but um, so these gradually change as they train. Different couple of uses here. And if you look at the results here. Um, to see at some point it goes unstable. I think I too large, but generally speaking, outside of this little flip up here, um, you start to see some improvement. That's after one cycle. And this is the one cycle uh, learning rate. So this one does not go as deep into it, but looking looking through these, are there any of these methods or functions that might be worth speaking a little bit more on? attribute within that you can put this here. I guess my question is what would be the benefit or was there I know he spoke about it but like comparing to just doing person dot age um, was there a reasoning for that? Well if you do person dot age and it doesn't have the attribute it'll cause an exception or is it right? But if you do get out or you can actually give it a default value so if it's not there, it won't it won't error out. So that's quite up quite commonly used when you're like, hey, if it has this, usually use the usually use the uh, alternative. The default is none, so you can check it later. But if you're want hey, to, if you have this attribute, I'm gonna use it. If you're not, I'll use some default. That's kind of when it's mostly used in my in my experience. And, and then it, it sounds like the alternative to that would be to put it into a try except. Yeah. So he talked about that. I think that that is the way he highlighted in there. Uh, I guess you could also do insert on it, but um, but yeah, this seems a lot cleaner. 
cleaner and easier to use. So they get HTTP network your attributes. Let's see if we recognize those. So helpful for callbacks um, to merge out halfway through. Does it? Did they talk about like when it? Does it? Does it? Um, when it doesn't doesn't exist, does it stop there like an assert, or does it continue through and just is not set to anything? Recall. Well, with, with Git Adder, you don't. I mean, the Python Git Adder. I don't know anything about this capital get out of it. He doesn't talk about that one in the lecture because that's from the fast ad. He's not using as much fast or any fast ad in this section, I don't think, other than the fast core. But he uses um but he does use get adder, I think, to protect, you know, for certain cases when you're doing callbacks to see if there's if it actually has that method or not. But now I'm trying to find it in the where he actually did the I guess he uses has adder, which is another way of just checking to see if it has. I feel like that was a, like for that being uh, it's sensitive. It was throwing me off there. I wanted to make sure I wasn't. Uh, but yeah, so um, let's find this one here, which returns a partial. Oh, yeah, he uses it for um, the run callback. So he uses a function called run callbacks that he uses to run all the callbacks on list. And so he'll, he uses a get adder to find out, to get the method. If it's not there, just use none. And if it's, so it, then it just checks. If it's not none, I'll just go ahead and do it. Yeah, they're right there. Oh, right there. There, run CVS. Um, you'll see it's the get adder. Got it. Okay. So it just uh, returns a none object and then basically then puts in this clause if it's not none, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead and call it. Yeah. And I guess if it is, it just doesn't. Go further with this. In that case, yeah, because you don't necessarily define every method on your callback, so and that's fine. We'll just skip over it. Awesome. Any other thoughts or takeaways on um, going through the material or the videos I might have skipped over or be helpful to talk about? Well, one thing I will note again, I think I said already, but I just want to emphasize that at the very end of the notebook, he has a little sex goes, hey, after the after the fact, we found out that the uh, using the context manager wasn't so great after all because of the problems with when you run exceptions. Because he uses exceptions to try to like short term. Uh, um, where we are working on building our first Apologize. flexible training. Apologize, I'm going to have that start. Yeah. You did Anyway, the end of the, the the notebooks from the course twenty two P two, it he has a section there saying, "Hey, we changed this after the lecture because we um, found out that the way the interrupts work with the call with the context manager, not the interrupts, but the exceptions were in the context manager, not what they really wanted because they want to be able to interrupt the training before in the before fits and the before epoch and everything else. So they switched back to using decorators. That was something to just be aware of because the code that's in the library, the min AI." Mini AI uses the decorator approach. I don't think it actually matters to the user, but it, that's the way it is. Was it during the uh, the hooks or the? No, no, it's not during. It's after the. It's in the. It's in the notebook. It's after the uh, the lecture's over. Like they came went back to the notebook. So you, there's no words. Just at the bottom of that notebook, you'll see. Um, Am I? Missing it? Did I go too far? Yeah, you just go up a bit. There it is. Updated oh, versions, yeah. Does not be around outside of snake zones when Google is sharing it. I don't think so. Let's see. So, yeah, surprising feature which doesn't let us raise an exception before the yield. So we replace the context manager with a decorator. I'm wondering if that has anything to do with um, I mean, it's not a surprise. I don't know. Because it's not a, it's, it's a, it's a surprise thing, but it makes sense when you consider how, what context, how context managers are supposed to work. So, <laughs> my daughter wants 
say hi. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, those are good, definitely good, um, good things to call out. Um, what I wanted to bring up here was the different sections, just to make sure we talk through each of these. Yeah. So we, uh, we talked about the, the basic callback exceptions, metrics, basically everything that we had talked about is put into these general frame, frameworks. Um, this is where talkback mm. context manager learning rate finder and the scheduler here, those are um, trying to optimize those learning rates. Good to know like how that influences the, the overall there. And then our bumping by torch friendliness and colorful dimension. Anything else that you all want to look at or see through? Uh, uh, well, I guess the other big part of this um, was the activation section, which is notebook 10. Um, it just calls it notebook 10 at the 53 minute part. Um, that was kind of interesting to me because he went through and was now starting to look at the, which I think a lot of uh, times you don't do in the, in these kinds of courses or these kinds of discussions and going through and look at the actual activations, which are the statistics of the activation so you can better understand how well you're, um network is training and where the problems are i thought that was really interesting um they're doing the histograms of the activations and he was showing that well with his particular choices the histograms were showing that the training was actually going quite badly um most of the neurons or most of the uh, neurons what do you call that most of the um matrix elements there were were zeroed out so they weren't doing anything once they get zero right they can't learn anymore so mm -hmm. So that's what that was all very interesting. So that I think that kind of leads up into the next section, which is going to be on you know, normalization and, and initialization uh, of the of the uh, weights and weights and biases, right? Mm -hmm. Try to fix that basically. That was his conclusion. So now we have the tools to do two things: the tools to flexibly change. That's because we've got a flexible learner, and we also have the tools to, to diagnose, diagnose it by looking at the activations. Mm. And so next, we will start looking at improving our models by using these tools, right? Okay, we call it notebook ten. So that that is in line with what I was just looking at here: the activations thing. Yeah, that's. So he went through that one. He's done with that one. Next, so next thing I guess he can be picked it up with uh, number eleven, initializing, and then, well, off we go. And yeah. the train quickly means getting to a high learning rate. I read that in the paperwork. Paper. Um, That's right. You did mention. Yeah, yeah, he mentions that like if you use a, the higher learning rates are, he wanted the learning rate to be as high as possible to avoid overfitting. Um, mainly because you're not really, he said, you're not visiting the the uh, activations that many times then. Mm 
the more times you visit them, the more likely you're to look at something like that. Does that sound familiar? I think that's what he said. But... Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of some of those thought processes that he was building. Yeah. Up, why he was heading a certain way with some of these. So, um, yeah, looking at this. Um, interesting. Okay, well, thank you all for listening. And um, I know it was probably less coding than you were all hoping, but I was glad to get the supplements and the. the people where he was bringing it up and hopefully it helps you as you're going through and planning these out that knowing when you need something quick versus uh, and then if you do see overfitting or underfitting this what ways you can potentially improve um, improve with those no I think it's good because we all saw the video we all looked at the notebook so I mean mm -hmm. I think it's fine to like go off and look at the papers and we can talk like talk through anything that cause problems but I, I you know for me i didn't see anything thing that was really that got hung up on did you torn in the videos or i'm, I'm behind yeah <laughs> 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 we so we, we ruined the mystery for you yeah yeah <laughs> yeah well, i think I'm, you... I'm two videos behind but um i think with what you said last week ron and then i think it's all it's Makes sense. All right, cool. Did yeah, you talk fine. about the callback? Yeah, and in this video, he talks more about the call. He goes step like he takes a step back and does this base basic callback version to try to make it a little clearer what callbacks are and how they work. And he does spend a little bit of time talking also about context managers and how they work, like a little simple example. So that's mm. worth worth seeing, I think. Um, okay, I'll catch up on the um. Break. Time change break, yeah. Yeah. Time have change holiday. Have you yeah. all gone through the pattern recognition and machine learning book by Christopher Bishop? No. Um, it's on my no. list, it's my very long list. Um, it is, uh, actually, real quick, if that's okay. Uh, it is a, um, available it's, online. It's yeah. Actually, open source or not, but uh, it's actually su it's surprising. It's from, uh, 2006 or 2007, but <clears throat> it it's all about the thought process behind it and kind of the math derivation between the different steps. But um, really, is a great way of understanding how the different. Uh, so chapter five is on uh, neural networks. Um, if you wanted a little bit more of a um, concept of like the different ways that feed forward. Um, in the uh, error classification was, I don't know if deep learning was in a space that could. But yeah, so I mean, it's a highly recommended book, and Microsoft, you know, publishes it now for free on their. I mean, it's officially free. It's not like uh, there's um, any shenanigans yeah. going on. Um, yeah, so if you, it's if highly you regarded. It, yeah, it's it's highly recommended, and uh, some of the a lot of the answers are on there, but if you want it a little bit more in depth, it's, it is uh, application agnostic. So it's just pure, I guess, theory, it's not actual application. Um, we're doing this in our machine learning course, but. Um, oh, cool. So it's really and kind of that way when you start to see like, you know, how these different ones are set up and everything um, really helps kind of explain how they all interact and how they're even able to um, communicate information forward, backwards and so on. Mm. Nice. He's got a newer version of that book, I guess, out that's probably not free called Deep Learning. Or is oh, it a okay. sequel? Same yeah. guy, Chris Bishop. Um, I do have that one on my shelf that I keep meaning to someday go through. But... <laughs> huh. I don't know if it's considered a, a uh, a replacement for this other book or a sequel to it, I'm not sure. Deep Learning Foundations and Content. Yeah, it just came out fairly recently. I don't want to... You can get solutions for exercises 2 through 10. Yeah. But... November 2023, so that's fairly recent, I guess, a year ago. 
Yeah, on his personal website, he you know, has all the different photos. Oh, cool. Um, so yeah, talking about this, and yeah, it's available for purchase from Springer. See how much I just bought one. Um, I'm part of the um, Open Data Contract Exchanges, uh, dealing with like data mesh and everything. And some of the people that are on that steering committee are authored some of the. O'Reilly books, and it was like eighty dollars now, for like cover price for one of those, and, and it's just like a soft cover, two hundred page O'Reilly book. It says in the preface that it should be a successor to an even older book of his, and a companion to pattern recognition. Okay, that's good because yeah, I think it doesn't. There's some lack of overlap there. Have you used these in any of your actual projects at any point? The uh, callbacks. Oh yeah, for yeah. sure. I mean, I've used callbacks with Keras, um, not with Fast AI, but with Keras AI. Yeah. And it's not uncommon in other frameworks to use callbacks. As I mean, GUI programming is full of them, but um, GUI programming. But um, I think. Yeah, mainly in Keras, I think. And is callback in Python synonymous to callback in JavaScript? What was that you said? Callback in Python, is it synonymous with the term callback in super, uh, JavaScript? Like oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, um, it's generic, it's generic computer science concept. Yeah. There's no callback. Def well, I mean, there's I guess there's that there might be some library to help you callback. So there's no callback uh, special syntax or anything provided by it's just a function. It's just a function, right? <laughs> it's just yeah. It's a pattern. It's like a design pattern. Mm. Well, 